My name's Angelo and welcome to We Want Picks. I'm going to break down the entire UFC Singapore fight card, giving you my picks, predictions, and DraftKings plays. But before I do, let's look at the wild success that is our community and was UFC 292. UFC 292 was great. All across the board, everything we did was absolute gold. And that took our DraftKings winnings up over the 200,000 mark. We are now sitting at 224,000 plus dollars in DraftKings winnings over the last couple of months. I think we're talking three months here, not a year, not five years, a couple of months. Here's a sample of some of the tickets that get sent our way. We get everything from a couple hundred dollar winners to $78,000 winners. We have a 60,000, a 50,000, 12s, 13s, 10s, everything, all of the spectrum is our premium community. Meaning, we have people just playing a couple of bucks and they're still double tripling winning that money. We have people doing the big large field tournament entries, using our tools, using the information and taking home big dollars. We have a comment here, Hockenwind won the VIP package, the DraftKings Rainmakers VIP package to Abu Dhabi. His prizes were $16,000, 10,000 of which was straight up cash and then 6,300 of which was the VIP package. His quote, and this is from him, he is a premium member, says, no joking, used all the analyst tools and fighter breakdowns in We Want Picks and nothing else. And that is a similar story across the board. Again, $224,000 in DraftKings winnings from our premium members just the last couple of months. That is not a coincidence. It just isn't. There's other people putting out information and trying to get you, sign up for my service. Here's my DraftKings. Do they have these tickets? Do they have this community? Do they have the tools that we offer for your $10 at wewantpicks.com? Not only are you going to get tools, you're going to get insight and information. We're going to give you our cash core plays for your cash lineups. We're going to give you our GPP core plays for your large field tournament lineups. We're going to give you our live dogs. We're going to give you leverage plays and our Fades. We're also going to give you the best DraftKings ownership projections in the game. On Fridays around 6 p.m. Eastern, actually earlier this week because this card is crazy early, you're going to get this cheat sheet fully populated with the ownership projections. We quite literally have the best ownership projections in the game. The last four events in a row, we were number one in the world. That includes against large companies like Osimo and Roto Grinders. The week before that, we were second in the world. Before that, back up to one the best ownership projections in the game. We're then going to take every single fighter and we're going to rank them by salary depending on your contest type, cash game, single entry, and multi-entry. And then all of that information will also be preloaded into our Draft Kings Optimizer. This will be literally build lineups for you. It'll build 150 lineups for you. A couple click of the button and there you go. And if you don't know how to use the optimizer, well, this video right here, just click that. It'll walk you through exactly what to do and how to do it. Premium membership is only $10 a month. It is not a coincidence that our community continues to take down tournaments. We continue to get 50,000, 78,000, 10,000, 5,000, 2,000, $1,000 winners week in and week out. That is not a coincidence. It is only $10 a month. The ownership projections alone are worth more than that. The scoring projections are worth more than that. The optimizer is worth more than that. But you're going to get all of that plus everything we do for FanDuel, bets, and everything else included in this $10. It's wewantpicks.com. Just click become a member at the top. There's the sales pitch. Let's go ahead and break down this card. Also, if you hate the sales pitch, I'm sorry. That's how we keep the lights on. We have well over 2,500 premium members that are very happy and continue to use our services. We're going to get past that 3,000 mark very shortly, especially after the success that we had last week. Anyway, let's go ahead and break down this card. We have 13 fights on this card. And opening up the card, we have Seng Wu Choi taking on Jarno Aaron. Seng Wu Choi, this guy's a clean striker. He fights nice and tall. He throws with power. He's got a really good leg kicks. He does a good job utilizing them. And he kind of uses them like a jab at times. He's a technical striker. He'll set up takedowns, mostly at the end of rounds, just sort of to lock them in. Even though he's well-rounded, he is riding this three-fight loss streak, as you see here. He lost to Caceres, who is solid. Koulibau, who is solid. Trezano, who is solid. Neither one of these, you know, none of these guys are world champion level, but all of them are very solid. You're going to see this knockdown, the Trezano fight. That was actually a double knockdown. They hit each other at the same time. They were both knocked down. Anyway, he's the favorite here, a resounding favorite at $8,800, and I get it. He should win this fight. He's taking on Jarno Ahrens. 
Jarno Aaron's is a decent prospect. He's got solid striking, solid takedowns when he needs them. He's mostly a striker. He wants to come forward, dictate that pace. He does a really nice job working the body and then coming to the head. He throws everything with power, and that is what makes him dangerous, but it also sets him up to be taken down. And for that reason, I do think Sang Woo Choi is going to win this fight. I am not going to spend the $8,800 on Choi. Jarno's actually a decent underdog here at $7,400. If you think he can get his hands going and if you think he can defend the takedowns. But the reality is, Sangu Choi should win this, but he's a bit overpriced at $8,800. Then we have J.J. Aldrich versus Liang Na. I'll tell you right now, J.J. Aldrich is annoying. All right, that's as nice as I can say it. This Lipsky fight, look at that salary, $9,400. Look at the points she put up, 23. It's an absolute embarrassment. She's $9,400 again. And I'm not going to fall into that trap. With that being said, she's going to win this fight. She's probably going to dominate this fight, bell to bell. And she may put up some very real numbers. But even when she dominates and does everything right, she still doesn't put up her worth. Look at this. 59, 63, 69. Those are wins. Her highest score ever is 86. And if I spent $9,400 on you and you put up 86 points, I'm not happy with that. So she's a full fade at $9,400, but she should absolutely win this fight. She's got decent striking. She can grind grappling. Her submission defense will be good enough to not get submitted here. So she should beat Liang Na handily. And I understand the price tag. If you're just equating the price to if this person's going to win or not, she's worth $9,400. She's going to win. If you're then extrapolating that out to how points are scored in DraftKings, she's not worth that $9,400. She is taking on Na Liang or Liang Na. I apologize. I always uh, get those switcheroonied for some of the Asian fighters. Anyway, Liang Na, and it's crazy because here it says Liang Na. It's Na Liang on the UFC website. So even they get it wrong. Anyway, she's going to come forward. She's going to swing wild. She's going to throw with intent. She's going to try to get you to the ground and then she's going to go crazy down there too. She's feast or famine. She's just kill or be killed. She's winning inside the distance. She's losing inside the distance. She is pretty tough. And she is very aggressive and very active. She's got two fights in the UFC, both stoppage losses. The Carnalozzi fight went a little longer. She put up 41 points in a second round stoppage. That's because she had three takedowns. She comes forward aggressive with those takedowns. If she can start taking down J.J. Aldrich, she could potentially have some success. I don't think she will. I think she loses this fight. So I don't even think she's worth it at $6,800 as an underdog. But if you hate J.J. as much as I do, then you know, maybe it's sort of a spite play there. Then we have uh, Billy Goff. And he's taking on Yusaku Kinoshita. Billy Goff is an underdog. Billy Goff is making his UFC debut. So Billy Goff has no stats here. He did fight in the uh, Dana White Contender Series. So we have that. But that's not a DraftKings uh, opportunity. So you're not going to see any stats here. But the reality is Billy Goff is a well, very well-rounded guy. He's got clean boxing, a solid clinch. He has really good wrestling and grappling. His top control is actually spectacular, and he's got solid cardio. He'll push a pace. He does get dropped. He was dropped in that contender series fight. He was dropped in a whole bunch of regional fights as well, but he just like bounces right back up. Like you'll fold. You're like, oh shit, this fight's over. And then whoop, whoop, bounces right back up, continues to come forward. So if you trust his chin, he's absolutely the play here because he is fight, fighting Kinoshita or Kino as people like to call him. This guy is a powerful striker. He's got legitimate one-punch knockout power in his hands, and his striking is clean. It's not wild. He'll come forward, and if you throw at him, his defense is perfect. He'll move a half an inch and then fire back. He's got the big power. He's got the defensive striking. His takedown defense sucks, though. His offensive wrestling is actually not bad, but his takedown defense sucks. He just got taken down and mauled by uh, Adam Fugit. I will say he's got a good get-up game. So if you take him down, it's hard to hold him down. Uh, he was able to get taken down four times in this fight, which means he got up three times before Fugit finished him. Long story short here, I think Goff wins this fight. Goff has takedowns just like Fugit. Goff has better top game than Fugit does. A little bit of a worse chin. So the chin's a little worrisome, but $7,800, I will shoot my shot on Billy Goff. Then we have Sean Kanang or Song Kanang or Kanan Song. Again, they have Song Kanan. UFC listed it as 
Kanan song. So it's all over the place. Anyway, uh, he's a very powerful striker. His wrestling also not great. He does have one punch power. He doesn't have the cleanest technique though. He will just bomb away. He can be beaten. You can beat him with pressure. You want to stay in his face. You want to back him up. His wild swing all of a sudden is a little more telegraphed. And then that's how you can sort of grind him out and get him done. His takedown defense is not very good, but he is composed. He does work back to his feet. And that's where he's most comfortable. This Ian Gary loss was incredible. He had Ian Gary. Look at this knockdown. This doesn't do it any justice. In that first round, he had Ian Gary down and out. He, I mean, Ian Gary was on ice skates. Ian Gary was two seconds away from being finished. But Song, instead of bombing away and chasing that finish, he decided to grapple. Horrible fight IQ, a terrible decision, and, you know, unfortunately, it is what it is, and that fight is now done. He ended up getting finished in the third round, but he's a very, very, very powerful striker who, at times, can make some questionable decisions. He is taking on Rolando Bedoya. Bedoya's the pick, $9,200. I will spend that money. Uh, he's an in-and-out striker. He's got lots of movement. He does have nice variety with his strikes. He'll work in kicks. He'll even work in a ton of combinations. He doesn't have that same one-punch knockout power that Song does, but he does have volume. He will light up your legs as he did against Chaos Williams in that debut. His takedown defense is very solid. He does have submissions if he gets taken down. I think he wins his fight. I think he stays in uh, Song's face. I think he stays busy, touches him up, potentially even gets a finish. So I like Rolanda Bedoya to win, and I do think $9,200 will end up being worth that price. Then we have Makal Olechuk taking on Chidi Injikawani. And this is an interesting fight to break down. This line is moving quite a bit. DraftKings pricing basically has it even, and that is pretty much where it is in real life as well. But I will say money is coming on on Chidi, so Chidi may end up closing as the favorite in this fight. He's not just yet, but he may end up being. Mikhail Olenchuk is a very good striker. He's got incredible speed. He's got a lot of pressure. He does have power, and we saw that in these two knockouts in a row, Brundage and Alvi. Um, he does have some grappling holes, though. He can fade as the fight goes on as well. This loss to Kyle Baralo, he actually looked good in that first round, didn't look great in the second, but that's a quality loss. Kyle Baralo is very good. His last loss before that was Dustin Jacoby. Also a quality loss. This guy was ranked second in the world at one time in jiu-jitsu. Um, Jimmy Crute outgrappled him. That's something that's going to happen. St. Prue is an interesting one because St. Prue, you know, he does have all those Von Flew chokes, but he's not really a grappler. He's a striker. But keep in mind, these fights were at light heavyweight. He is now down to middleweight for these fights here. So the reality is, I do think McCall is going to lose this fight, but you may want him in your lineup because he may end up being spectacular. And the reason I highlighted his losses is to point out that they are quality losses. If we look at Chidi Injikawani, his opponent, this guy's also a very good striker. He is insanely fast. He has a ton of power, good distance control. My issue with him is he is low volume. Right? He's not throwing out a ton of strikes. He's not really staying in your face. But he does set a nice pace. He does manage that range really well. Um, and he can light up your legs and defend some takedowns. Chidi and Jaquani is incredibly dangerous. He's incredibly fast. He's incredibly powerful. The only things that concern me here is, all right, I get the Durayev loss. This guy's going to stay in your face. He's a very active wrestler. I mean, he should have put Durayev out the same way that others have, but he didn't. Okay, fine. The Rodriguez loss is incredibly annoying because if you remember, he smoked Gregory Rodriguez. He had that dude's head wide open. You could see his brains. He had him split so bad. And then he still came out in the second round and got beat. Those are red flags for me. But if I remove that sort of, you know, the those fights, which is ridiculous because he's got four fights. I'm taking two out of the equation. But if I remove those instances, if you will, and just look at the talent, look at the skill, look what he did in the first round to Rodriguez. I think he wins this fight. He's going to be faster. He's going to be more powerful. And I think he's actually going to be more technically sound as well. The big question is, is he going to fade and what's going to happen? So, Chidi's the pick. My advice to you is pick your side because I do think there's a finish here. And I think whoever wins this fight is going to put up some very real numbers. And there's only a $200 price difference between the two of them. Um, then we have Garrett Armfield taking on Tashiomi Kazama. Garrett Armfield 
is coming off this short notice loss to David Onama. That was his UFC debut. He stepped up on short notice. But overall, he's a technical striker. He doubles up his jab. He switches his stance. He's always working forward, but he does stay controlled and he doesn't take a ton of risks. He does a really nice job kicking the legs, softening you up, and then working up to your head. He doesn't always look for offensive takedowns, but he does have clean power and he'll shoot right through a double, things like that, if he does attempt a takedown. And I mentioned he's coming off this loss to David Onama, but that was a very short notice step up. He is the medium-sized favorite here. He's taking on Tidashiomi Kozama. This guy's a solid grappler. He's averaging two takedowns per fight, or at least he was in the road to the UFC tournament. Um, his takedowns are solid. His takedown defense can definitely use some work. His BJJ is great. He does scramble well. He does sweep. He even submits people off his back. He's a grapple first fighter, and he can be chinny on his feet. So if you can get to his chin, you can light him up. He is going to shoot takedowns. If he gets you to the ground, you can be in some trouble. I do think Armfield's going to win this fight, but I don't like him at the $8,700 because while Garrett does have some solid power in his hands, he can be pushed around. He can be taken down. He can be submitted. So the pick is Garrett Armfield as far as who do I think is probably going to win this fight. But if I'm building a DraftKings lineup and I need a couple of underdogs, I think Tashiomi Kazama is one of the better underdogs. He's a little underpriced here because his last fight, he was knocked out super early. But the reality is he's a good grappler. And if he can get this to the ground, he's very dangerous and he can make something happen. And we just watched Garrett Armfield get submitted. So... Uh, when I'm building my lineup, Kazama will definitely be a consideration for um, one of my underdog slots, certainly if I'm building a large field tournament entry and um, you know, I'll take some risks there. Then we have Waldo Cortez Acosta taking on Lucas Bresky. I'll tell you right now, Waldo Cortez Acosta, one of my more confident guys on this card. I'm very, very confident that he's going to win this fight. I'm almost positive he's going to win this fight. But here's the problem. He doesn't score that well in DraftKings. 90 is his highest score. And that was when he just walked down and lit up Chase Sherman. And he still was only 90 points. If he scores 90 points and I spent $9,100 on him, I'm not furious, but I'm disappointed. I at least want, you know, 91 points, right? If you, I at least want enough points for the spent. Does that make sense? $8,900, I want 89 points. $9,100, I want 91 points. Yeah, it's one point off. So I'm not going to be furious. But if you have a heavyweight, a favorite heavyweight in your lineup, you're expecting a finish. Waldo Cortez hasn't gotten that finish yet in the UFC, but he's an athletic striker. He does hit hard. He moves really, really well. And he has legs made out of titanium. Every one of these fighters, Jared Vandera lit that dude's legs up. Chase Sherman did as well. Rogero de Lima did as well. Rogerio worked in some takedowns, and that's what won him the fight. But the reality is that Cortez can just take leg kicks and it doesn't matter. I do think he wins. I think it's pretty one-sided, but he is fighting Lucas Bresky. Yes, he is winless in the UFC, but Bidet is now a 13-1 fighter. Carl Williams is an incredible fighter as well. Uh, didn't look great in his last fight, but he did look great against Lucas Bresky. Lucas is a well-rounded guy. He's a solid heavyweight. He's got good power, solid speed, good takedowns, and really nice leg kicks. The leg kicks worry me here because we've seen Waldo can be kicked in the legs, but I'm not that worried because he doesn't even limp. Like, nothing happens. It's it's wild. So I do think Waldo, Waldo Cortez wins this fight. I do think he's due for a finish. So I want to say fade him because he hasn't been worth his cost in the past. But at the same time, Lucas is the type of guy that he might be able to get a finish here or might be able to make something happen. And then all of a sudden, he is worth the money. I don't know what I'm going to do in my lineup, but you have all the information you need for yours. He's right there if he's going to be worth the value or not, but I'm very, very confident that he will win this fight. Uh, then we have Parker Porter taking on Junior Taffa. Junior Taffa is uh, Justin Taffa's younger brother. He's a kickboxer through and through. This guy's a kickboxer. He's big. He's fast. He hits hard. He's all the things that you expect from a kickboxer. The big question in his last fight was, well, does he have takedown defense? He only had four professional fights at the time. Now he has five. And no, he doesn't have takedown defense. Yes, he defended a few of Usman's takedowns. This is Kam or, uh, Muhammad Usman. Yes, he defended a few of those takedowns, but not enough. He lost that fight. He lost that decision. He barely got anything going with his hands because he was defending takedowns and then being taken down. But 
He is dangerous. He does possess knockout power. And if he connects clean, he's going to put you out. He's a typical heavyweight with very real power in his hands. He's taking on Parker Porter. Full disclosure, Parker is a friend of mine in real life. So yes, I'm going to be biased. And no, I will never pick against a friend. What kind of piece of shit would I be? That's never going to happen. If I take the bias aside and I just look at this fight objectively, we have a former professional kickboxer who only has five MMA fights and he just lost because he couldn't defend the takedown taking on an actual MMA fighter who has 22 professional fights and he does have takedowns. He has takedowns. Uh, he took down Badeau. He took down Chase Sherman. He took down Parisian and Chase Sherman has good takedown defense. So he does have takedowns. He didn't need any takedowns in his last fight because he knocked out Braxton Smith. Parker Porter does have good technical striking. He does have very good footwork. And when he trusts his takedowns, he's got good takedowns as well. So these are heavyweights. Anything can happen. You connect. That's it. On either side, Parker can knock out Junior just as well as Junior can knock out Parker. Parker's my buddy. I trust him to come in and wrestle. He's not stupid. He understands the assignment. Look at his last loss. Fine. Justin Taffa. Yes, Junior's older brother. But Justin Taffa hits incredibly hard and he has just a freight train for a lower half. He's hard to take down. And before that was freaking Jolton Almeida who might be the heavyweight champion at this time next year. So these losses are quality losses. He at wars with Badeau, Sherman, and Parisian after a very short notice UFC debut loss to Kyle Dawkins. Point being, there's a very clear path to victory for both of these men. If the kickboxer can keep it standing, he could have success. If the more well-rounded MMA fighter can work in takedowns, he could have success as well. I'm going to shoot my shot. I am going to spend the $7,600 on Parker in my lineup. Uh, and then we have Aaron Blanchfield taking on Tyler Santos. Everybody loves Aaron Blanchfield. I get it. People are calling her the future champion to the point where I thought it was her nickname because people literally just say future champion Aaron Blanchard. That's just how they say it as if it's part of her nickname. The reality is I originally was on the other side of this fight. I originally picked Tyler Santos. I have full on flipped to Aaron Blanchfield. A lot of that has to do with the drama on the Tyler side. I'll explain that when I'm on her screen. But for now, let's talk about Aaron Blanchfield. She's going to come forward. She is going to throw in volume. She throws a lot of punches. Her striking in her last fight against Andrade looked very, very good. And then she's going to work in takedowns. She's taking down pretty much every single opponent except J.J. Aldrich. Not taking down J.J. Aldrich is a red flag. Like, she tried. It's not like she didn't. She tried and couldn't. And that was a red flag. But then she came back. She beat McCann, beat Andrade. Before that, she took down Miranda Maverick seven times. And I, the problem with this one is, does Miranda Maverick just not have takedown defense? And J.J. Aldridge does. And she only needed one against McCann, who we know sucks. And Jessica Andrade, who we know now has a little hard time defending takedown. So there are some red flags in this. Because the Andrade win looked really good when it happened. But now we just watched Andrade get smoked again. So how good is it? Molly McCann, when it happened, wasn't a bad win. She was on a nice win streak. And now she just got tooled around. So some of these wins do have question marks. Miranda Maverick has proven herself both before and after the Aaron loss. J.J. Aldrich has not. Fuck J.J. Aldrich. Anyway, point being, if Aaron Blanchfield can get the takedown, she's going to have worlds of success. Phenomenal grappler, and her hands are improving very, very quickly. She is taking on Tyler Santos. Tyler Santos is coming off the... Title fight loss to Valentina Shevchenko. Valentina Shevchenko arguably lost that fight. A lot of people think she lost that fight. Tyler Santos looked good. She had three of her own takedowns, had some success striking, and had a couple of reversals on the ground. She looked very good in that fight. She scored 77 in a loss, had 10 minutes of control time in a 25-minute fight. That's incredible. A lot of people think she won that fight. Frankly, I think she won that fight. But, and she has great hands, great jiu-jitsu. Great, she's great. She's the better MMA fighter in this matchup. She is absolutely the more well-rounded fighter. I expect Aaron to have better takedowns than Tyla, but Aaron's jiu-jitsu and Tyla's jiu-jitsu is probably pretty close, or at the very least, Tyla's jiu-jitsu defense should be enough to not be submitted by Aaron. Originally, that's why I picked Tyla. All of those things, the red flags in Aaron's record, the, the red flag that she couldn't take down J.J. Aldrich, and then the incredible performance Tyla had against Vince Shevchenko made me lean towards her. But... 
thinking about it a little longer, looking at it a little longer, digging a little deeper into her gym drama. She's being sued by her training partners because she doesn't pay them. She basically got kicked out of her gym and sued because she wasn't paying the people around her. So now she's a year and a couple of months removed from her last fight at a new gym Half of the, you know, half of the people she's ever worked with hate her guts because she hasn't paid them. She has a lawsuit. She had to have surgery. Like there's a lot of stuff that's happened in the last year. And I feel like it's probably too much. And how many times have we seen people like Dominic Reyes fight for a title, look incredible, probably should have won that fight and then never win a fight again. We have seen that far more often than we ever should. And uh, Tal Santos may fall in that category. So I'm full on on the other side, but... With all of that being said, Tyler Santos at $7,700 is good value if this Tyler Santos, any of these, if any of these Tyler Santoses show up, she's incredible value. 77 and a loss, 126, 114, 78, not fantastic, but she's only $7,700. And then 96 against that bum, Molly McCann. So Tyler Santos should definitely be considered for your lineup, but certainly you should factor in her gym drama and everything going on there. Uh, then we have Rinya Nakamura taking on Fernie Garcia. Rinya Nakamura should win. He should dominate. He should be in your lineup at $9,600. Rinya Nakamura is a world-level wrestler. He's got incredible jujitsu and incredible one-punch power in his hands. He's not missing anything. He's Yes, he's very young in his career. He's only 7-0. So he's relatively untested. But he has all the skills that you should ever want in a fighter. And including... We get a lot of these, uh, you know, international fighters, a lot of the Asian fighters that don't have the wrestling credentials that you will get from some of the Middle Eastern fighters or the American fighters. But Rinya does. Rinya is one of the fighters that does have international wrestling level credentials. And that's important because he is taking on Fernie Garcia. Fernie Garcia, where the hell are you? Fernie Garcia is very well-rounded guy. He has wrestling himself. He's got good jujitsu. He's got good pressure. He's got good counter striking. And he likes to come forward and he likes to make things happen. He's incredibly tough and he's dangerous. This loss to Brady Highstand, he almost pulled that out. He dropped Brady, which you're not really going to see the credit here for. Dropped him, jumped on him, almost submitted him. So Verdi Garcia is very dangerous and he's not a quitter. This is probably going to be Rinya's first real test. But I still think Rinya's going to get it done. He's got the wrestling, so great. Let him lean on that. We'll rack up the wrestling points. He's got the submissions. Great. Get one. He's got the power. Great. Get a knockout. Either way, I think Rinya is going to be worth that price tag. And while Fernie's tough and while we love him here, I don't necessarily think he's going to win. So that $6,600 is probably not worth it. Then we have Giga Chikadze, Giga Chikadze taking on Alex Caceres. $9,000 is a lot of money to spend. And I'm going to tell you, he should be in your lineup. You're not going to be able to afford all the 9,000 plus fighters that I said should be in your lineup. You're just not going to be able to. So you should pick between who you should and who you shouldn't. Uh, the reality is that Giga Chikadze is incredible. He's an incredible striker. His leg kicks, his body kicks, just his kicks in general are absolutely spectacular. He's going to walk you down. He's going to light you up with his feet, light you up with his hands. If you get a little too close, he'll keep you at bay with his feet. He's incredible what he can do. He is coming off this loss to Calvin Qatar, and that was a straight-up beating. He got wrestled early, outstruck late. Like, it was a straight-up beating. He's been gone for a year and a half since that fight, just too embarrassed to show his face. But before that, he put away the incredibly tough Barboza, the incredibly tough Cub Swanson. He put away Simmons, but the Cub Swanson put away, it was wild because he it was a body. He worked the body. And Cub, who we know is like, Simmons not the toughest guy in the world. Cub Swanson, we know, is one of the toughest guys in the world. And Giga worked his body so bad, it just didn't matter anymore. And his body quit on him. Not his chin, his body quit on him. And that's how good of a kicker that Giga Chikadze is. He's taking on Alex Caceres. Alex Caceres is a tried and true vet at this point. He came through the Ultimate Fighter uh, 12 years ago. And if I scroll down, you're going to see he fought everybody. I mean, look at it. He's fought everybody. And some of these names you don't recognize, but I do because I've been watching this forever. Kang in 2013 for a while, Dennis Kang was going to be the man. And there's a lot of really good fights in here. He fought Pettis, Faber, Rivera, Jim Miller. Like these are a lot of really good high level opponents. And then he finally hit a nice little streak. He beat Peterson, that, that dweeb Hooper. Kroom kind of sucks, but you know, he beat Choi, who we broke down earlier. He lost to Yusuf. 
but then he knocked out Erosa, first knockout in a while, and then he just beat Pineda in a tough fight there. And in many of these fights, he is the underdog and is still able to pull it out. So point being, Alex Lacerda is a very, very well-rounded guy. He's not dangerous, but he's got good technical striking. He's got some sneaky jujitsu where he'll snatch things up. I do think Giga's is going to do whatever the hell he wants to do in this fight. I don't know if he's going to stop Alex Caceres because Alex is tough. He's not the type of guy you're just going to put away whenever you want to. And he has all the experience in the world now. And he seems to be hitting his stride later in life. If we go back to Giga. And so, yeah, stoppage, stoppage, stoppage. This decision, 68 points. This decision, 70 points. This decision, 51 points. Point being... If you think Giga goes to a decision, and if you think Alex is incredibly tough, do not put him in your lineup because without takedowns, he doesn't score well at all. He scores like absolute shit, frankly. But if you think this is going to be a stoppage win and he murders, and he just murders Alex Caceres, then yeah, he should be in your lineup. 103, 105, 92. He should be in your lineup. I personally don't think he's going to get the finish, so I'm probably not going to have him in my lineup. Instead, I'll have Max Holloway, who we'll break down in a minute. Then we got Ryan Spann and Anthony Smith. This is an interesting... Whoever wins this fight is going to score a ton of points. If you're doing large field tournaments, you're doing big tournaments, then you should have lineups with both of them, right? Or not both of them. Don't double it up. But you should have some lineups with Anthony Smith, some lineups with Ryan Spann. Because whoever wins this fight is going to score a ton of points. And let's just look at Ryan Spann. 103, 92, 4, 18. And that's the problem. He's feast or famine, 107. The 37 to Walker is interesting because he knocked him down twice. But outside of that, when he wins, he scores really well. When he loses, he scores like crap. Six fights in a row didn't get out of the first round. So if you think he's going to be on the right side of this, because he has the power in his hands. He does have the sneaky submissions. He's got 21 wins with 18 stoppages. I believe 16 of those stoppages are, no, 12 of those stoppages are submissions. 12 of his 21 wins are submissions. Almost half of his overall wins and a lot of his finishes are submissions. And it's not because he's shooting beautiful take. It's because he's catching you in things. He's wrapping things up. He's snatching things. He's making stuff happen. So Ryan Spann, incredibly dangerous, both on his feet and on the ground. He's taking on Anthony Smith. Anthony Smith has literally already won this fight. And when he won it, he put up 120 points. He lit Ryan Spann up on his feet with two knockdowns. Then he hopped on him and submitted him. And he put up 120 points. If you think that both of these fighters are exactly the same as they were in 2021, the last time Anthony Smith won, then Anthony Smith should be in your lineup. It's a no-brainer. He's the underdog here. But if you look at Anthony's most recent performances, including the one against Walker, where he looked old, he looked slow, he was headhunting, he was talking to himself, he was like, his brain was doing God knows what, then he should not be in your lineup because Anthony Smith seems to be fading faster than most. So I personally am not going to have Anthony Smith in my lineup. I'm probably not going to have Ryan Spann in my lineup either because there's too many things that could go wrong. He literally already lost this fight. But if you have a tournament lineup, a cash game, probably leave him out. A tournament lineup, whether it's large field or even mid-size, build a lineup or two with Anthony Smith and a lineup or two with Ryan Spann because whoever wins this fight is going to score a ton of points. I think Ryan Spann wins because of uh, Anthony Smith's recent troubles in the cage. Not like not his personal life. Guy's fantastic. But, you know, talking to himself in the cage, um, just headhunting the entire time against Johnny Walker when he couldn't get the knockdown early, just didn't, that, that wasn't the Anthony Smith that beat Spann, Crew, or Clark. And then we have the main event of the evening. Max Holloway taking on the Korean Zombie. Max Holloway, $9,700. He should be in your lineup. But here's the caution. I don't think he's going to win by stoppage. I think this is probably a decision. And he may only put up 89 points like he did against Arnold Allen. And in that fight, was he worth the money? Maybe not, right? You spent 9000 You got 89 points out of him. This could look the same. Or this could look like the Calvin Qatar fight, which I'm actually thinking it does, where he puts up so many freaking strikes that he needs nothing else and he scores a ton. He had three takedowns against Yair Rodriguez and that helped, you know, 30 or uh, 15 points of those takedowns and then whatever the control time was contributed to the 153 points. The 209 DraftKings points that he earned against Calvin Qatar was only 
strikes. And Korean Zombie is insanely tough. So he may take the same abuse that Calvin Qatar took, which means Max Holloway is going to land a ton of strikes and put up some very real numbers. Max Holloway has great takedown defense, decent takedowns when he needs them. We know he's got great boxing. We know that his offense is incredible. Uh, he has he doesn't look old yet. He, he's probably 65 in fight years, but for some reason doesn't look old yet. So let's ride that youth. I'll probably spend the $9,700. But if we look at the Korean zombie... I mean, he's got a nice body of work here. He, he beat Dan Ige 113 points because he worked in takedowns. That might be his game plan here is to work in takedowns. He did lose to Brian Ortega, but then, you know, before that he, and before his uh, military layoff, he beat Edgar, he beat Moicano. I mean, this guy can absolutely make stuff happen. He is dangerous on his feet. He is dangerous on the ground. Where's that twister submission uh, he, he had a twister submission, only one of three in history. It was one of two up until two weeks ago. And the reality is Korean zombie got his nickname because he likes to stay vertical. He's incredibly tough. He's not the type of guy you're just going to immediately get him out of there. So with all of that being said, I still think Max Holloway is going to win. I still think he's going to put up huge numbers. So he will be in my lineup Guys, join premium membership. Join this community. Join the community that has $224,000 in winnings over the last three months. Join that community. It's only $10 a month to be amongst these people, to have the same tools, information, insight, the same DraftKings projections, the ownership projections, the scoring projections, the leverage plays. It's not a coincidence that we have the best ownership projections in the game. I literally pay somebody to make it, I pay somebody to gather all this data and come up with that proprietary number. Our ownership projections are our number, which is why they're better than everybody else's. And they're gonna be preloaded into the DraftKings optimizer. This is gonna help you build a lineup. This will help you build 150 lineups. This is where you, okay, I think these people win, put them in my lineup, definitely fade these people, or I want this much exposure. It's gonna spit out the file. You load that file in the DraftKings and now you have all your lineups ready to go. We want picks.com. Click become a member. It is only $10 a month.